Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alyssa Goodman. I'm one of the co-directors for science here at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. And so I have the privilege of welcoming all of you uh, and also welcoming uh, the uh, many from the crew of the Tara vessel, who you will, uh, uh, which you will hear all about um, this afternoon from Eric Carsenti. I'm not uh, going to introduce Eric. I'm going to introduce Chris Bowler, who's going to introduce Eric. <laughs> And so um, before I do that, I should explain that this event is part of a series of events uh, that goes under the general title of the undiscovered. And what we mean by the undiscovered for this year at Radcliffe is discoveries that are very, very hard to anticipate. So for example, you go out to measure the deceleration of the universe with a lot of telescopes and a lot of people, and you accidentally measure the acceleration of the universe and win a Nobel Prize. Or you go out and there's 15,000 species of plankton known, and you sequence a lot of stuff, and you wind up with 10 times that many. But I don't want to steal Eric or Chris's thunder, so I won't tell you anything more about that. Um, what I would like to say is that I'm really, really honored that this all came to be and that Tara is here. And I should explain that Chris Bowler, who I'm about to tell you about, uh, and I were fellows together at the Radcliffe Institute a couple of years ago. And we knew that Tara, the vessel that's moored in Boston Harbor now, and you can go see it, um, was going to be making this big world tour. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring the Tara mission here to Radcliffe and let you hear about it from Eric and let you experience its educational aspects by going to the ship. And I'm sure Eric will say more about all of that. And so I'm just really glad that that has come to fruition. And I invite you to come to more of these undiscovered events. And the big annual science symposium that will cover many topics in science is on the 26th of October, as it says somewhere in the fine print. Um, and, and then that next slide is, is uh, my, uh, my uh, final point here before telling you a little bit about Chris, which is <clears throat> I'm an astronomer. I forgot to mention that. And we're kind of embarrassed that, you see that little tiny blue piece that says ordinary matter? That's what we actually can observe in the universe. And then we knew that we made one mistake, which was we left out all this stuff that's called dark matter. And then that discovery I told you about a minute ago where there was the acceleration instead of the deceleration of the universe, uh, that was when we needed to invent this funny thing called dark energy, which we have no idea what that is. Okay, so when we say the undiscovered or the unknown, it's, it's basically everything that's green and orange in that picture. Now, interestingly, what I've known, what I've learned, rather, um, in the very recent past about um, life sciences and about the work of Tara gives you the bottom half of this diagram, which looks oddly similar. And uh, for those of you who are not biology experts, we go in the little slice uh, called eukarya, which also includes things like plants and yeast. And so it's not even just us, OK? And so all that other stuff is bacteria and viruses and other things that you'll hear about today. And mostly, we didn't know about it until we sequenced large fractions of the ocean, which you will hear plenty about today. So anyway, I think it's remarkable that a lot of science, especially today, is um, <clears throat> let's say, data that will tell us something about our universe and our world in the future, but that we don't understand. And so part of the mission of this undiscovered theme is to explain that if science were taught a little bit more like that, it might seem more exciting. Of course, we run the risk of sounding like we don't know what we're talking about, but we try not to do that. So anyway, before I ramble on more, let me just tell you that I'm really pleased to have Chris Bowler here. And I'll just tell you briefly that he is the CNRS Director of Research at the Institut de Biologie, half English, half French, de l'Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And uh, he himself is uh, someone who uses uh, genomics approaches to study uh, biology, uh, biology, <laughs> uh, plants and phytoplankton and particular diatoms. And so he's much more expert than I uh, to introduce Eric and his work. And he also serves as a scientific coordinator for the Tara expeditions that you'll hear about today. So thank you. And Chris, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Um, so, as, as Alyssa mentioned, I'm normally based in Paris. Um, I had the fortune and the honor to be a Radcliffe Fellow a couple of years ago um, here in, uh, in Harvard. 
uh, where I met Alisa, and that's when we first started talking about Tara. And it's really the, uh, the, the realization of a dream today that, uh, that, that Tara is in town. Tara is docked uh, down close to the New England Aquarium uh, after a two-year expedition. Um, and Eric Carcenti is here um, uh, with us today to, uh, to present uh, today's lecture. Um, so that's a fantastic culmination of, uh, of, of events, of circumstances, and thank you so much for, for coming here and, uh, and, and being interested to hear more. Um, so to introduce Eric, um, Eric um, uh, uh, got his PhD from the Pasteur Institute uh, in, in Paris. Um, he then went to uh, San Francisco, UCSF, to do a postdoc with Mark Kirchner, uh, who is here somewhere, uh, Harvard faculty, since 25 years, I think. Did you tell me yesterday? Yeah. So, uh, so it's, again, a, a culmination of, uh, of, uh, of, of stars that come together today, uh, with Mark being here as well. Um, so following the, the, the postdoc, uh, at UCSF, uh, um, um, uh, Eric went back to uh, Europe and worked in particular at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory uh, in Heidelberg, which is the um, uh, European center of molecular biology, uh, with today about two and a half thousand people working there or something. And Eric had been the, uh, was the director of the cell biology program um, at EMBL. Uh, for 15 years. Um, so he set up the cell biology program uh, over there and during that time made all kinds of uh, uh, fundamental discoveries about how cells work, uh, the, the, the mechanics of, of cells, uh, the physics of, uh, of, 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 of interacting with the biology of, uh, of, of individual cells and made all kinds of wonderful contributions to, to that field. Um, at the same time, Eric was also a sailor um, he loves sailing, he's passionate about sailing, and um, uh, was finally able to combine his, his passion for biology uh, with his passion for sailing uh, through the interaction with the Tara Expeditions Foundation, um, who, uh, uh, through this collaboration together, um, Eric has been uh, set, set up a scientific program uh, based upon the research schooner uh, that he will introduce to you. Uh, to understand more about life in the ocean. And as you will see from, the, from, from his talk, you will see how he's able to combine his, his expertise uh, in uh, understanding cell biology through a, a physical perspective, perspective of physics of the system, how he's been br brought that thinking into understanding of, of life in the ocean um, and where life in the ocean came from uh, 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 from an evolutionary point of view, way, way back to the beginnings of time. Uh, so it's a fantastic combination of, uh, of, of, of very high-level cell biology with understanding of, of ocean processes. Um, uh, Eric, so we, we have been working together for 10 years now on the, on the Tara Oceans uh, project. Um, it's very far from finishing. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, but we've already done a lot of things together, and Eric has received many accolades uh, uh, over recent years. Uh, he, run, he won the, uh, the, the, the gold medal of the CNRS from the CNRS in France, which is the, the highest accolade uh, for science in France. Um, he won that in 2015, um, and he's won several other medals as well for his scientific achievements. Um, to the extent today that some people, some people in France talk about uh, Tara as the new Calypso, um, and some people talk about Eric as the, uh, the modern-day Darwin. So um, I'm sure he's going to entertain you for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, giving you his view about, uh, about life on our beautiful planet and in the oceans. So thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. So it's very really nice to be here. Uh, I like this uh, this place and this town, and uh, especially being in the you know I'm I'm living on Tara right now, so living in the harbor. So it's very really nice. I can walk around as if I was a, a Boston citizen. So yes. So thank you, Chris, for this uh, beautiful introduction. 
Um, yes, I, w I would today what I want to do is to talk to you about, um, I, will, I will give you, a you know, I know that this is a very general audience, so I try to make a general talk, and I will, I will talk about my previous work on the, the cells, actually, as Chris said before, and after that I will come to Taroshan. There is a link between the two, I mean, uh, I will try to show you how this is connected uh, in my, at least for me, uh, so how, how I, see, I see this connection. So, um, you know, we, we all start as a round ball, you know, an embryo, uh, a cell, that this is a frog egg, you know, that I work on this in Mark's lab, actually. I will, I will show you some experiments we did with this. And this egg divides many, many times, thousands of times, and then it makes an, an, an organism. What is absolutely amazing is that this, you know, it's very complex. The, an egg is, is an, um, an embryo is extremely complex. There are lots of complicated processes that, that are going on during the development. And, you know, this, this is why very often people think that there is a god that should have generated this. And we, but as scientists, we try to, even if there is a god somewhere, we are trying to understand how this actually forms. So when they, when they divide the first cell, the cells in general and the first cells of the embryo, they make a spindle. So you see here, so the chromosomes condense. You see the chromosomes in, in red here. They contain the genetic information. They condense, and the, the, the mitotic spindle is a, is a machine which is made of tubes, small tubes, that segregate the chromosomes to the two daughter cells. So when you look at this again, you know, even, it's even more fascinating than just looking at the embryo dividing. You see the precision with which uh, the chromosomes are segregated. There is almost never a mistake, and yet this is a very dynamic process. Made and uses. There are tubes that organize themselves into complex, uh, a very uh, functional structure, a machine. So, uh, you know, these days a lot of people think that life is DNA, that the DNA contains the information, and that the, the, this is directing the organization. But it's more complex than, than this, and in fact, I just want to go back to philosophy a little bit. And, um, you know, Kant already uh, was, was thinking about this in his book on the critics of judgment. And he said, you know, in an organism, organ functions emerge from properties of parts and the whole. So this is interesting because we usually, you know, very often in, in modern science, we are working in a very reductionist way. We think one thing does something, which does the next. But he, he understood that it was more complicated than this, and that you know, we, we, we need to understand the whole and the parts to understand how living system functions. And living matter is therefore a self-organized end, and this was the first time that somebody talked about self-organization, so it's a philosophical concept. This reasoning led Kant to question the use of classical causality principle to explain life, and he suggested that a new type of science would be necessary to explain how hand and means are interconnected. So when I read this, I liked, I liked it a lot because, you know, this is really the problem. It's, we have to crack this problem. So um, somebody else also was a great thinker, uh, Erwin Schrödinger. And, you know, he gave a series of lectures in, in, the, in the 1940s uh, in Trinity College. And he, he said some things which are very interesting. He said, how can the events in space and time which take place within the special boundary of a living organism can be accounted for by physics and chemistry, because he thought that we should be able to explain life in terms of physics and chemistry. The obvious inability of present-day physics and chemistry to account for such events is no reason for doubting that they can be accounted for by those sciences. So obviously, this is what we think, yeah? But um, at the time, it was not so obvious. So, and then there, there are two sentences which are very interesting. So he says there are two ways of producing orderliness in living matter, order from disorder. So he was a specialist of statistical phys physics, so statistical mechanism, which is known to phys physicists. So he was not so surprised about this. But the other one was the order from order, so cell duplication. And that seemed to be more complicated to him. So he said, he suggested that there were, at the time we did not know about DNA, he suggested that there was something in, in, in living matter which, was, which he called the aperiodic crystal, which in fact is, now we know, is the DNA. So now we, you know, the orig origin of uh, living matter organization, we, we, we have to think it in, in, in two different ways. One is statistical mechanics, how collective behavior lead to emerging functions and systems. And the aperiodic crystal is obviously cell duplication of the DNA molecule. So the DNA molecule has to be seen really as something which has information in it, 
but it doesn't really direct things. You know, the, it generates the production of molecules which have information, but these molecules have to interact and interact somehow co collectively and stochastically to generate complex pattern. So now if we, if we think about, you know, about life, not only now, but in a very general context, so from a, com a context of evolution and of local events, I think the DNA kind of links both because the, the DNA is the memory of what happened over four billion years during the evolution. And then, and there was a, com a lot of complexification during this time of the DNA, but of cells also and organisms. And at, the, at, the, at, the ti at our time scale, we have to understand how our cells and organisms get organized, but this also comes from the origin of order at the evolutionary level. So they, they, it, it's just that there are lots of things happening during long time, you know, which are kept in the DNA, and at our time scales, the, the molecules which are at a given time in, in the cells get organized into complex uh, functional systems. So, um, uh, just to show you something about the, the question of evolution for at the level of organism, you know, one of the big questions also, uh, for, for example, for uh, Darwin and um, Lamarck, they were discussing a lot about the, the origin of the eye. You know, eyes are, are striking because they are beautiful structure, extremely precise, they function very well, and how can this come about, you know? And obviously, at the time, they did not have much, uh, much ways of understanding how this works, so that's why he developed the theory of evolution with, you know, we did not know about mutation, variations, and selection. But, uh, in fact, there are many different eyes. You see, like, these are the eyes uh, of a bird, which are very much like ours. They're like a, a, a photographic uh, um, system. But there are the eyes of insects, which have multiple facets. Uh, here, these are eyes into... Um, a, a, a clam or a shellfish, I don't remember exactly. There are many eyes in here at the, at the edge here, and this is a, a primitive worm, a flat worm. There are, there are very, very, very simple eyes here. So the eyes have, have you know, have, have developed in different ways, but they always are used to, to get light and inform the organism of the, of the light that can. But they took very different shapes. So man, now I, I will, before going into this, we, I will come back to that after Tara Oceans, but I want, I want to say something on the origin of order at the cell level, so at the level at our time scale. And uh, I will start with uh, experiments made in, in, by Mark and by me, actually, and uh, using the cell cycle and, and, and assembly of the mitotic spindle as an example to understand how morphogenesis can happen at the cell level. So there, there are two questions about morphogenesis. One is time how time is determined in, in cells, and the other is shapes, pattern in, shape, in, 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 in space. So this is just a, a beautiful experiment that actually dro drove me to go to Mark's lab. I, in, he showed this, this movie in Berlin in 1981, and I really was stru struck by this. So he showed, this is a frog egg, actually, that has not been fertilized. So the, they have removed the nucleus from this egg. There is no, no cytoskeleton, no, no, well, no, no centrioles in there. So they cannot divide, basically. But what you can do is prick the egg with a fine needle, and this starts the cell cycle. So you see, the egg, the egg contracts every 30 minutes very regularly, and this shows that there is a clock somewhere in this, in this, in this, uh, in this cell. There is a clock going on, ticking, and at the time, we had no idea what it could be. It, it's really interesting because I remember this time, you know, it was, a, it was really exciting because it was a mystery. We did not know how this could, this could function generate a very, a very precise time, time like this. So I don't go into the details of this because this is a long story, complicated, but I'll just show you the principle. So the clock turned out to be, in fact, uh, you know, a, a circular system, so you have an inactive regulator of the cell, which can be activated by an activator, which is synthesized continuously in the cytoplasm of the egg. This activator, by combining with the regulator, activates it, and this one does a lot of things, I will show you, on the, on the cytoplasm of the, of the cell and changes its shape. Then, in the same time, this complex activates its own degradation, the, the, the degradation of the activators, so that the, the, the clock can, can go back into its original state. So this is a, an oscillator, and the, I show you this because this is a general principle in biology, the, this loop, 
you know, there are lot, lots of loop feedback loops and uh, systems that are uh, getting feeding back on themselves. And uh, this is part of self-organization principles, actually. So what does the, the, this, this uh, active thing do? Well, it does something very interesting because it, what happens that in, in interphase, you know, when, when the cells don't divide, they have a nucleus. So you see the nucleus here at the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, there are tubes, the microtubules, which are nucleated by the centrosome here. When the, the clock goes into, uh, when the, activate, the, 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 the regulator gets activated, it changes the state of the cytoplasm. So it's just one molecule which changes the state of the cytoplasm in such a way that instead of making you know, an astral array of microtubules, it makes a bipolar spindle. So the, the centrioles duplicate, they go at the two poles of the, of the spindle, and the microtubules get reorganized into a bipolar spindles, the function of which is to segregate the chromosomes to the two poles of the cell. So you see this is really amazing. It's a very complicated system. There is a clock that changes the state of a cell so that it can divide and segregate its chromosomes. So it's very important because this is the, the, the mechanism by which the information which is in the DNA is, is transmitted to the, to the dividing cells. Now, this is um, uh, the clock. It works, in fact, because so this is the, the activator. This is the inactive uh, um, molecule of the clock. And it be becomes activated abruptly here. There is a, a positive feedback loop here, a negative feedback loop. And then it, the, the, regulate, the regulator gets degraded, and so on. So you get really an oscillation this way. And each time, what happens when this becomes activated, you get a, a mitotic spindle. So the next question was actually, how do you make how do you assemble a spindle like this with microtubules around the chromosomes? So this is interesting because this is a machine, actually, that segregates the chromosomes. So how do the, the machines uh, ca can get assembled? So that's another experiment I did in Mark's lab. So I, I put the French connection and the way of pigs. This is a, a joke because, you know, when I came to Mark's lab, uh, he put me in, on a bench together with another, another French guy. And our, so our bench was called the, 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 the French Connection. And uh, there was another bay <laughs> on which there were two, two students, uh, Tim Mitchison, and, uh, who is a professor now at Harvard, and Frank McKeon. And the two of them were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty lousy. So they were living, you know, they were dirty benches and things like that. So we called it the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> But this turned out to be nice because we, you know, I used the centrioles. The team was, was purifying centrosomes from, from cells, and I used the centrosomes that he was purifying to do some experiments with, um, in frog eggs to try to understand how the spindle forms. So, so then what we did was a very, this was very primitive. We, we just uh, injected centrosomes into frog eggs. Uh, which were uh, either in interphase, so we could block the eggs in interphase or in mitosis. And when we injected centrosomes in interphase, we got very nice asters. So they nucleated microtubules as expected, they form asters like in, in any cell. But in mitosis, nothing happened. We did not see any asters. And we were very surprised because we, we could still see the spindle, the, the meiotic spindle in the, um, the spindle anyway in the egg. So it, it meant that the microtubules could assemble around the chromosomes. But the centrosomes could not nucleate microtubules. And at the time, this was really strange because everybody thought the centrosomes were organizing the, the, organizing the spindle. So uh, what I did then was to inject uh, chromo nuclei of cells without centrosomes into frog eggs in interphase and in mitosis. And around each nucleus, I got you know, spindle assembling around chromosomes. So this was really, for, for, for us, it was really exciting because it was really the chromosomes that induced the machine that is going to distribute them to the two daughter cells, you know? So when I came back to Humble, I wanted to continue working on this. And um, with a, a postdoc, actually, uh, Rebecca Held, who was a, a previously a student of Frank McKeon, who was a, a student of Mark. So you see there is a <laughs> history behind of people. And we, we put DNA onto, onto beads and put these beads into frog egg extracts and spindle assembled in vitro around the beads. 
And when you look at the formation of the spindle by video, you see that the, it's really a self-organizing uh, organizing system. It's really amazing. The macrotubules grow from the chromatin, and they self-organize into a bipolar spindle. So they are not very nice here because this is stuck on the cover slip to have quantitative data. But they really, they can be really beautiful, actually, like not normal spindles. So this, oh, this whole observation you know, led me to the, the question of self-organization in general. And it's easy to talk about self-organization, but if you want to really understand how it works, you have to understand what self-organization is based on. So there are, there are basically two principles that lead to the emergence of patterns in, uh, in, uh, in systems. One is uh, collective behavior and energy dissipation. So you, this is, th there was a very old experiment. If you heat a liquid from below in a thin layer, like here, the, at the beginning, when you increase the temperature, the, the water molecules behave uh, randomly, so you don't, get, you don't see anything. But suddenly, they start to behave in a coherent way. So the molecules of water form uh, cylinders. They form re really regular cylinders. But these cylinders are dynamic, so that they exist just because mo water molecules are its convection. They are, they are moving all the time, but they move collectively together, so that a pattern emerges. The second mechanism is uh, reaction diffusion. And the first experiments were done by uh, Belousov Zabantinsky. By, by chance, uh, Belousov once uh, mixed two chemicals. And these chemicals, instead, you know, normally if you mix a, a, a blue with white, you get uh, something intermediate, or red and white, you get some kind of uh, other color. But when, when he mixed these two chemicals, they generate, generated waves or patterns that were steady state, that steady state. They kept oscillating or they formed patterns. So at the time, people did not believe this because it looked like it was violating the, the second principle of thermodynamics. But finally, this was accepted because they, they, they really demonstrated that it worked. And in fact, it's Turing, you know, the, the guy who, who actually invented the computer, who developed the theory of the reaction diffusion. And reaction diffusion is, is in fact, two molecules react, they diffuse, and one of the molecules that diffuse feeds back onto the reaction and inhibits it. So you can, and then therefore this can oscillate or gen generate patterns. So I thought, you know, and also at a different scale, if you, if you look at the, the formation of uh, fish shoals, uh, it, is, it is also a self-organized self system because the fish look at each other, they like to swim together, so they come to each other, but they don't like to be too close to each other, so they, they move apart. And this is what this plus their speed uh, that determines the shape of the, of the shoal. So it's not one fish that tells the, the shoal we should go that direction. It's the collective behavior of the fish that determines the, the shape of the, of, the, of the shoal. So I thought, you know, that something like this was going on to, for the organization of the spindle. And we, we started to look for what it could be. So one, the, one, I was wondering what, what in the chromosomes could get the microtubules to grow just around them. And one day, uh, Jan Matai at, at EMBL was working on, on the nucleus also, and he came to me and he said, you know, I, I have a small protein called RAN, which can be in two states, uh, a high energy state or a low energy state. And this one is in, maybe involved in, your, uh, in the assembly of the spindle. So we, we, he had a lot of tools to study this. And we could demonstrate that, in fact, this was the case. So this, this, this molecule, when it is in a GTP state, so a high energy state, generates a gradient. So this generates a, a gradient around the chromosomes that signals the microtubules they should grow in this region. And this forms a gradient because this is a reaction diffusion system. So we demonstrated this, actually, uh, theoretically. So the, 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 there is a, a molecule on the chromosomes that loads GTP on the run, and the molecule in the cytoplasm that unload, that transforms GTP into GDP. So that you have a reaction here, reaction diffusion around the chromosomes. So this generates a gradient that leads to local assembly of microtubules. So this was the first part to understand how the chromosome induce spinal assembly. Now the second question was, how do the microtubules get organized into a bipolar structure, into a shape? And here I worked with physicists uh, Stan Leibler and his postdocs. And um, so what we did is to develop uh, a simple theoretical system. They did experiments like this, actually. But then we did it in, in a computer. 
So you, you, we know that macrotubules can, can bind to motors, so the molecular motors that move along the macrotubules by uh, using energy. And some of the motors can move to one end of the macrotubules and others to the other, but they can cross-link macrotubules also. So by, by uh, playing with the parameters, you know, the speed, the, the, the probability with which they bind to macrotubules, the speed of movement, and various, uh, various uh, things, we could start to build computer simulation to see what, what happens when you mix uh, motors and macrotubules randomly and how the, the system evolves. And what you see is that under certain conditions, you get for, for much formation of self-organized asters or vortices or sometimes uh, networks of uh, macrotubules that look like spindles a little bit. And uh, then, uh, just to show you live what happened, so this is a very old simulations. So this is what, this is exactly, you, you see, so you, you, you start from random, a random system, and you get a very organized pattern, spontaneously. So the typical self-organized system, you know. And uh, if you change the parameter of the system, you can get other patterns, for example, uh, vortices, as you, you can see here. So I, at the end, they, they managed to actually, uh, with, um, with Rebecca and another postdoc, uh, Francois actually modeled the spindle completely. So this, this is beautiful because this is based on, uh, there are parts of this simulation are determinist, but most of it is just stochastic. So it's stochastic interaction between information-rich molecules that lead to the self-organization of the, of, the, of the spindle. And you can model it in, in, in the computer, so we really have understood how the system works. So this is very important because we really understand morphogenesis at, at this level. Okay. Now, we have understood um, uh, the, the assembly of the, of the spindle, but then, then I, I, I thought there is something very interesting because we can, we, can we can generate spindles without chromosomes. There are ways of doing this. So when you generate spindles without chromosomes, they have no function. But when they, they are interacting with chromosomes, the function emerges from the interaction of the macrotubules with the chromosomes. So I really like this because um, this, this is really going back to the, the, the question of uh, Kant. And uh, you know, cell shapes self-organized from stochastic interaction between information-rich molecules. Complex functions emerge from interactions between self-organized shapes and function results from contingency. There is no goal and end. So the, the, it's just the fact that there are macrotubules and, uh, and chromosomes that the function emerge from this, from this system. The chromosomes don't know they want the microtubules to segregate them. It's just that the whole system segregates the chromosomes, and it just happens. Philosophically, I think it's really important to understand this because, you know, this is the, the, the fundamental question of, of life, actually, is how do we get to do what we do from nothing, you know, from... Uh, and then if you, if you start to look at cells in general, you know, there are in our body is made of many cells. We have 200 cell types. They have different shapes, and these shapes are largely determined by the cytoskeleton, so microtubules and uh, uh, filaments, the filaments which are, which are forming your muscles also. And depending on the state of the cytoplasm of these cells, you can generate different types of shapes. And this is amazing because we have 200 different cell types, but we have, this is one genome. So it's not the genome that decides on the shape of the cells. It's using the genome in a certain environment, you can generate specific cell shapes. So this is very important because, you know, for all the people who work on genomics and things like this, don't forget that. Yeah? This is uh, complicated. I mean, you cannot understand life by just sequencing. <laughs> Okay, so um, now I just want to say, to, to, to go beyond that a little bit, I want to say something about the, extend this a bit to the embryogenesis problem. So, you know, when you, when, when you form, how do you get from a ball to the first shapes of the embryo to, and then to the complexification of the embryo? So this involves a lot of symmetry breaking events. You break the symmetry of the cells. The cells don't, don't suddenly don't interact in the same way they, they, was, they were interacting before. Then the collective cell behaviors, there are feedback, loop, feedback loops also, like and reaction diffusion processes, and special temporal forward feedback processes. I will, I will show you what, this is complicated, but I'll just show you what it is with a, a nice example. So this is, I will take an example which is a, a, 
a group leader in, uh, in, in EMBL in the Department of Cell Biology that did these experiments, which are be 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 beautiful. So this is a fish, um, and uh, you see here the, the fish actually, you know, they, they feel each other by, by the lateral line. So the, the self organization of fish I showed before, it's because they can, feel each, they, they can feel the vibration of water, and this is because they have, in the lateral line here, they have small organs, sensory organs, that, feel the, that have cilia, that feel the movement of the water next, next to them. So Darren, who has been doing this experiment, he was, he was filming the formation of this uh, lateral line, and he, he saw that, uh, in fact, this is a collective of cells that move along a path that has been deposited before this stage during embryogenesis. So before, when the embryo was before, it, it, you know, the, a, a lane of, of uh, chemotactic molecules has been de de deposited on the muscles here. And then this collective that moves from behind the ear moves toward the, the tail along this, uh, this chemotactic trail. Now, the first thing you think is that the, there is a gradient on this trail and that the cells feel the gradient. But in fact, Darren showed that there is no gradient because what he did was to cut the trail here and the collective, instead of keep going because the trail is cut here, turned around and start to move back. So the collective feels the trail, but it must generate the gradient by itself. Yeah? So that self-generated gradient. So, so I hired a, a student who did the, actually the theory of this, and he, he, he developed a, a theory that, that demonstrated how the gradient is self-generated at the front of the cells, and then, in fact, this, this was beautiful because the theory actually described, in the same time, why the, the, the collective was breaking up and forming uh, uh, organs like this behind the, the, the moving uh, collective. So, um, what we learned is that cell shapes are determined by a complex network of cytoskeleton molecules. Forms and function emerge from stochastic events and cell form richness or so and from stochastic events. So now then, the, the thing is that cell form richness uh, probably or, or originates from complexification processes during geological times. And collective cell behavior and branching events allow for extensive variation of forms and in multicellular organisms. So what this means is that, uh, you know, we, what we see now is very complex. We see these complex cells. We know that before, it was not so complex, that um, yet there was only bacteria, viruses, relatively simple things. So we, we have to understand how complexity emerged. So if you look, look at the diversity of uh, oceanic cell shapes now, it's just amazing. You see here, you, you see just, uh, that, that's pictures we took with the confocal microscope of different cells, and you, you see a, a whole zoo of patterns. So these are unicellular cells that live alone in the oceans. And they live usually not alone. They live in symbiosis with many other small cells. And we don't understand how all these shapes are generated, actually, how the complexity, why is there so many different cell shapes? So if you look at evolution now, you know, uh, life started about 4 billion years ago, and there was no oxygen. So it was, uh, you know, mostly carbon dioxide and nitro nitrogen. Then it, probably bacteria and viruses lasted for about 2.5 billion years. And then, then uh, some photosynthetic bacteria started to emerge during this time. They produced oxygen that started to oxygenate the atmosphere. And eukaryotes started around this time also, so cells like us with a nucleus and uh, a complex cytoplasm. But the complexification of life actually occurred pretty late. I mean, uh, around almost at the same time, as the oxygen concentration increased to about 20%. And then you get protists, animals and plants, first in the oceans, and then they populated the, the, the Earth. So here is just the radiation, you know, and you see that the protists are actually, the, represent a lot of the diversity that exists on Earth. And you are here, human beings, close to mushrooms. And uh, this is uh, our branch, and the rest is uh, the protists. So, um, so the, then, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this based on what I did at the, at the cell, cellular level. I was wondering, you know, if uh, evolution was really working the way we think, that, uh, basically by, by simple variation and selection. 
And I think that it's much more complicated than this and that there, there are lots of interaction between cells, organisms, that lead to the generation of complicated uh, DNA patterns and, and cellular structures. So the, the Tara Oceans is a kind of, uh, in, this, in this context, is kind of the, the related to this because we, um, uh, we, we wanted to understand how these, all these organisms have been generated how the, the DNA has been complexified during this time and, and, and things like this. So we thought that it would be interesting to collect uh, um, these organisms during an expedition, but all the organisms. You know, very often the, the people who go do, do um, um, marine biology collect one type of organisms. Here we wanted to collect everything to see how these organisms interact and how the environment actually affects their, uh, their interaction or their behavior. So to do that, we needed to, you know, to, to collect data about, collect all these organisms, but also the data about the water mass, like uh, carbon, carbon concentration or oxygen salinity, temperature, depth, various kind of parameters. So the other thing is that the ocean is, um, is complex. Uh, and I think this, is very, this has probably been very important for evolution. The, the ocean is, there is a global circulation that is modeled here by the NASA. You see the Gulf Stream here. And uh, each big uh, oceanic basin uh, is, is a has a gyre or multiple gyres. So the, the water is circulating all the time. So this circulation actually transports the organism all the time from one point to the next. So it transports organisms from uh, warm waters to, to cold waters, from surface to depth. So they keep being exposed to different environments and to different organisms. So you can think of the ocean somehow as a huge washing machine that mixes you know, the, the organisms all the time. And in fact, when you, so this, I just show you a, a, a movie that shows the distribution of different organisms. In red here is, there are uh, uh, phot um, uh, diatoms, which are small unicellular photosynthetic organisms. In, uh, in blue, or other large organisms, Cinecococcus bacteria, different types of bacteria. And you see, so this is a model, a Darwin model, actually, the, that has been generated by uh, my, Mick Follows here at M MIT here. And what he does, what Mick does is basically he seeds the, the ocean uh, in a computer, the, the ocean of the Earth, with a mixture of, of organisms. At the beginning, you have a homogeneous distribution. And with time, the organisms distribute like this. So, they, so the, the whole distribution of the life in the ocean self-organized into a pattern also. So we wanted to, in order to study this, uh, we needed to develop a, 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 a method to sample. And we, 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 I discussed with um, the, uh, Etienne Bourgois and Romain Troublet, who are owning Tara. This is a 36-meter schooner which can be equipped for doing uh, sampling of biology and, and biophysical uh, um, uh, parameters. So we, the, we developed a complex uh, sampling procedure. So the organisms have, have very different uh, sizes. So they, you know, if you look at viruses, gyruses, uh, bacteria, or, and archaea, they, have, they, they measure between 0.02 microns to something like five to five microns maximum. And there are quite a lot of them per liter of seawater. So in 100 liter of, uh, of ocean water, you can get enough material to, to work on these, on these organisms. But when, you go, when the organisms become larger, there are less organisms per liter of seawater, so you need to collect more water to analyze them. And for the larger ones, the metazoa, so the, those organisms made of uh, multiple cells, uh, you need to collect quite a bit of water, you know, like something 100, lit 100 liters of, of seawater to get enough material to work with them. So we developed different methods. So, if, so to, to collect these organisms, you can pump water and filter it or collect it with bottles. But for the larger one, you have to use nets. So you use nets of different mesh sizes that allow to collect uh, the organisms by size classes. So we collected a lot of different size classes here. And each of these size class has been analyzed separately, which allows, uh, which makes it easier to sequence the genes or look at them by uh, by uh, microscopy. So, so we, we um, so the boat left in uh, September 2009. We sailed across the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, 
the Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic Ocean, Antarctica, South Pacific, North Pacific, and then we came back to Lorient. And in 2013, we sailed back to sail around the North Pole. And during all this trip, each dot here is a sampling site. So we, we decided to sample that way because uh, of the current I, I showed before. So we wanted to, to, the sampling has been very structured uh, relative to the oceanography we knew about the currents and, and uh, the, 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 also the, 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 the water masses. Because, for example, in the north of Indian Ocean, there is a region which is very acidic and which, which is very poor in oxygen also, as well as the, the East uh, Pacific. So the, the, there are very different water masses, and it was very important to collect in these different water masses to, have, to, to be able to correlate the ecosystem we were sampling with the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea was to, um, to analyze these samples using modern, modern technology, obviously. So we, we used uh, metagenomics to characterize, uh, you see, I, I, I still, you know, myself, although I said that genomics is not so interesting, we did a lot in Tara Oceans. Uh, we, we sequenced uh, metagenomics, so, that each, so it, it, this means that each, fi each filter we got from one station was uh, basically sequenced. So we get the DNA, DNA sequence, the RNA sequence, and we also um, collected samples to do in parallel Imaging, so we could characterize the ecosystems both at the genomic level and at the morphology level, and we obviously had all the, the environmental parameters. So all this work led to um, a publication. In, uh, we have many more publications since then, but uh, in 2015, where we published five papers together, where we showed how we could, um, what we could get from these uh, kind of samples. I'll show you now. Briefly, the, 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 the data we, we collected. So this is, so this is just, uh, this is the viruses. So I, I'll show what, what we found in, by kingdom. So this is a, the, the, vir the analysis of the viruses around the world and around the pole here. And uh, we found, found something like 480,000 viral populations. Uh, and you know, with knowing the thing. And the interesting thing is that the, only 19% of this was known. So this is huge. I mean, it means that you know there was nothing done basically on viruses before before tar oceans in the open ocean. And this, uh, you can do a lot with this data. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that the, these viral population cluster nicely into five ecology, ecological zones. For example, uh, the, you know, the, the yellow ones correspond to the population here, uh, correspond to temperate and tropical epipelagic water. Uh, the pink one corresponds to temperate and tropical mesopelagic, so around 600 meters deep. Uh, batipelagic is very deep, so it's uh, the, those ones. And the gray are Antarctic region, and Arctic region in blue. You see, it's amazing how these populations cluster together. It's really, I was completely surprised when I saw this. The viruses are very, very constrained, constrained by the, the environment. Now, for the bacteria, uh, so these are all the stations that have been sequenced, and uh, Shini Sunagawa at EMBL and then uh, at ETH has characterized 47 million genes, bacterial genes. So this is huge, a huge number of genes. And again, using these genes, you can look at the, the, the importance of, of various parameters on the composition of the genes, but also the composition of the, 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 the diversity of bacteria, so um, uh, the structure of uh, ecosystems. And one of the parameters that dominates, actually, to uh, determine what kind of bacteria live together is temperature. There is a linear relationship between the temperature and the, and the composition of the bacterial ecosystem. Now, for eukaryotes, we found something like 150,000 different species of uh, genuses of eukaryotes, and, and we saturated the, the diversity in, in, the, in the regions we went. So this means that we probably are not far from the total number of organisms, of, of uh, species, uh, genuses, in the, in the surface ocean. But when we, when we look at the genes, uh, we find something like 116 million unique genes, uh, and it doesn't saturate. So we are far from saturation. So there's much more than 116 million unique genes in the oceans, eukaryotic. 
and probably it, 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 we calculated it should plateau around 190 million. So this is a huge number of genes. Um, and one of the things we, we, we were interested in is, was to see how the organisms interact. So you can, using bioinformatics, you can see on the global data set, you can see how, who interacts with whom and, and uh, who excludes each other. So there is very little organisms that exclude each other. Uh, you see here the exclusion rate is about 20%. And 80% of the organisms live together. So they, it doesn't mean that they necessarily need, but a lot of them should interact in order to, to function, probably. And you can see this using imaging. So what you see here is, for example, a ciliate, which it lives in symbiosis with uh, another uh, protist. And here, lots of different protists, and each of them, almost none, no protists live, together, live alone. They, most of the time, they live in symbiosis, or at least there are organisms interacting with them. So it's extremely complex. And um, uh, you, you can also look with, with this data, which is amazing, you can look at how they interact. For example, this one, the, the um, ciliate, uh, which, uh, which has the symbiodinium as, uh, as um, uh, symbiont, uh, you, you can look at different places in the world and try to see whether this is always the same species of symbiodinium and, uh, and ciliate that, uh, that live together. And you find variations. So there are specific locations. The, the interaction changes according to where you are in the, in the ocean. So wh what I want to get at now, just to finish this presentation, is that um, how, did, you know, how did life complexify over the, the, the probably the last billion years? I mean, it, it remained pretty simple for for probably two or three billion years, but then in the last billion years, it became very complex. So, you know, in order to, to, to make a, a simple cell, we know we need about probably, but perhaps less, but something like 500 genes. A human being is made of 20,000 genes, and we found in, in the ocean 200 million genes. The real problem of evolution, in my, in my opinion, is really complexification, is how, you know, all these genes have been generated, not only all these genes, but how all these organisms, because um, the, you know, as have you have seen is in the previous slides, the protists, there are lots of protists that live together, so they form complex uh, systems. We live with, you know, bacteria in, in our gut, so it's, um, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, we have to understand how this, this happened. It's not only, obviously, uh, simple variation with, you know, point mutations or things like this, in selection, it's much more complex than this. So we need to work on this, I think. I don't know yet how, but this is, uh, this is important. So the question is, how far back can we go with Star Ocean's data? How did gene transfers, duplication, recommendation, mutation, and cellular interaction contribute to life complexification? I think there are important questions. How to predict evolution, structure, and distribution of planktonic ecosystems? And there, another aspect I did not uh, talk about, but which is very important, is that these ecosystems have a very strong impact on the geochemical processes that shape the, our atmosphere. And we, by knowing this, we can start to better understand how the ocean regulates the, our um, climate. Now, I would like to, just to finish on one slide, which is a little complicated, but. Uh, to relate self-organization and evolution. Uh, you know, there, there, there is a big debate uh, between uh, classical evolutionary people who, who are stuck with the idea of uh, uh, variation and selection and people who think that evolution is, self, is a self-organization process, just as what I described at the cellular level, but at a much bigger scale. I think it works like that too, but uh, we have to find out how to study that. So we note that self-organization involves different pr principles like collective behavior and reaction diffusion. Obviously, at the, at the scale of uh, two million years, it's not reaction diffusion, but it's probably transport. So inter organism interaction and, and transport are probably very important, for, have been very important for uh, evolution, at least at the, at the cellular level. And combinatorial processes like uh, of functional modules in cells and organism interaction are, are probably also key to the generation of complexity. Selection is extremely important, but this, it has mostly a role of elimination, so it eliminates the things that don't work. 
So I think that if we want to go into the understanding of evolutionary processes, especially early evolution, like the, the generation of the complexity of life in the ocean before we came about, which is important because most of the regulatory networks that we are built on uh, have been formed in the ocean, uh, we need to work on these, uh, on these kind of questions. So just to finish, I would like to thank lots of people. So these are part of the people who have participated in Terra Ocean. And these are very, you know, Mark here. Lots of people have been working on in my lab and with in different collaborators in, in, throughout the world. I must say, you know, being a scientist, I don't know, some people are not scientists here, but being a scientist is really a chance because we meet a lot of people and great people. So, so it's, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, I was interested in the, in the virus segregation. So viruses are also depending on the host. But yes. Virus segregate maybe differently from the other organisms that you have found, or that means that they can infect different hosts. And the other thing is, can you use virus that are so sensible, sensitive to the environment and changes? Uh, physical chemical changes as an indicator of climate change or changing in the oceans? Mm -hmm. So yes, viruses are actually, yeah, they, they're depending on the host. And I, I skipped this slide actually, but the, the, what determines the, the virus population somewhere is uh, a, there is a source usually. So the viruses are produced where there is a lot of uh, hosts. For example, in the um, in South uh, Atlantic, there is a source of viruses close to the Bangela upwelling because there are lots of bacteria there and uh, for the phages. And then they, they, we could show with, uh, with Tara that the, how they are transported, you know, how they, they populate the, a certain region from various regions. So there, there is a, the, the, the hosts play a very important role here. Yeah. So global distribution. Now, if we can use viruses to, for, for climate change, I don't know. We have not looked at this at all. The only thing we know is that you know, the, the, all these organisms are extremely sensitive to temperature. The, the bacteria, the eukaryotes, uh, you, you, a change in one, uh, one degree change in temperature changes completely the, the ecosystem. And you see there is this very tight relationship between temperature and bacterial uh, communities. So um, I think the viruses is probably the same, but uh, because it depends on their host. I think I will ask a question. Uh, so as a, as a physicist, uh, and if you have questions, please come to the microphone, but I'll ask this question first. <laughs> okay. So just come over here. Can you? Okay, thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, as a physicist, I'm obsessed with very accurate time, and I noticed that in some of the processes that you were saying were being regulated, at least from the videos, it looked like the, the periodicity was not in an exact number of seconds. And, and I'm just wondering whether that was true, first of all, and whether it's kind of a almost periodic, like cell division. Sort you you, you of mean thing. the what, what was periodic? So you, you showed the cell division happening oh, yeah, in yeah. early work, yeah. and it, it didn't look. Yeah, yeah, it's completely. Is it an exact precise. interval of time, or, yeah. or uh, sort of exact? No, it's very, Mark. It's very precise. I think. <laughs> I I don't remember, but I. So that's what I was going to ask. I was going to yeah. ask, is, if, if, is, is there any hint in, in, uh, in the organization of the behavior, the self-organization, in, in how accurately things are timed? In other words, can you... Yeah. Uh, not communicate with each other. Okay. Yeah. We understand the clock now. Yeah. But we understand how the clock works more or less now. So. Okay. Um, my question is more about mechanics of the whole thing, and that is, it's a sailboat. How much of the time is it actually under sail, and how much the, of the, the time? Well, and how much of it is motored, and do the currents help move you along too? 
It, it depends. Uh, for in Terra Oceans, we, we sell about 50% of the time with the sales. In the, core, in the, in the, the Pacific, uh, the, you sell about 80% with the engine, no? Yeah. It was in the Pacific, it was more complicated, so we, we had to use the engine a lot. I have a question about your sampling technique for yeah. microorganisms. Clearly, you deal mostly, as far as I can see, with the surface, with the photosphere. What about lower depths where there's very little light, different microorganisms? I, I did not get your... Uh, depths of 80, 100, 200 meters. Ah, yeah. So we sampled uh, at the surface and uh, at uh, 50, 70 meters and around 600 meters. So 600 meters is, uh, is called mesopelagic. So that's, the, 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 that's interesting because the life at the surface is completely different from the life at 600 meters. It's not the same organisms at all, which is normal because at the surface they live off the photosynthesis of the light, but at 600 meters they live off the, the, what, is, what dies at the surface and falls down. So it's a completely different uh, system. Thank you. And the, do, do the virus populations mix, or are they also stratified? No, they, they are stratified also. Yeah. Thank you. My question is a follow-on to his. Uh, how deep, eventually, do you plan to be able to pull up specimens, considering water pressure and the uh, difficulties of lowering collection mm -hmm. tubes or whatever? Uh, into the dark depths of the ocean. Yeah. We, with Tara, we cannot sample very deep, not, not because of pressure or anything, it's just because the boat is too small. We need large uh, machines to, to collect deep. But um, there is another boat, a, a big uh, boat, which was used by uh, Spanish scientists. And in the same time as we did this expedition, and they collected samples very deep, 4,000 meters, close to the bottom, four to 6,000 meters, yeah. So it's feasible. It's no, it's, uh, you, it, it requires some technology, but you can do it. Yeah. I want to come back to the uh, mechanisms of self-organization. Yes. Uh, one essential principle I thought I was missing in your talk was a phase separation. I think it was there in an implicit way, but phase separation is a principle of demixing. Yes, something absolutely. Something that is randomly mixed before. And doesn't that potentially lead or is an essential mechanism for speciation? Aha, for, that's a good idea. Yeah, for speciation, yes, it could be. Um, yeah, you don't talk about phase separation here, but it's, uh, it's also extremely important yeah, for, uh, for self organization processes. Um, we could use this concept probably for, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think about this, but this would be very interesting to look into this, yeah, to, to see whether the, you know, the, the species separate. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, I think we, we will end there, and uh, we, we have a reception downstairs, so please uh, stick around. Uh, talk with Eric if you have further questions. Talk with the sailors if you want to know more about life on board <laughs> and life on the high seas. And uh, please join me in thanking Eric for a superb uh, lecture. Thank you.